Welcome. It's time for another fireside chat. It's been a minute since I've had one of these sessions of talking to the camera, and uh, you'll notice that my sweatshirt is more faded, my hair is a bit longer again. Also, I'm in a totally different room, in a different studio, in a different house, in a different state. I moved across country. And um, yeah, a lot's changed, but during all of that uh, time, I kind of spent a lot of uh, mental energy and, you know, physical energy and money um, on condensing my kind of sprawling studio down into being more uh, streamlined, more focused, um, but that's not the focus of this video. In this video, I want to talk about uh, my old friend, kind of the one that's been with me since the beginning here, the Electron model samples. So um, I have to give you a little bit of my kind of personal uh, history with this one. So. I, I originally got this um, to accompany the Minilog XD, which was my first kind of true synth. And um, for a good long time, that was, that was my pair, the Minilog XD and the Electron model samples, and that was fantastic. And I will say that um, the, the model samples is what really taught me how to use step sequencers effectively. I mean, sp specifically the Electron step sequencer, but of course, a lot of it applies to other ones as well. Um, and then it also taught me generally how to focus on rhythm and percussion, how to use drum machines in general. So I, I feel like I learned a lot from this one. Um, and then after I got to a point where I kind of outgrew those two, or I wanted more diversity, I started acquiring more and more and more gear. Um, now I've kind of gone in the realm of like buying way too much, figuring out what doesn't work for me, selling or trading stuff away. And I've now got things pretty well streamlined, I think. Um, so about a year ago, I bought uh, the 1010 Music Black Box as my primary sampler, and that has a lot of overlap uh, with the model samples. And then also I bought the Syntact, the Electron Syntact, when it came out, which was just under a year ago. And so between those two devices, the Black Box and the Syntact, that really covered all my bases in terms of drum machines, uh, sequencing, um, you know, as well as synthesis. So uh, kind of all the stuff that I used to do on the model samples I now do with the combination of the black box and the Syntact. Now, this is a totally different price bracket we're talking about, though, because for the, the black box and the Syntact together, um, I mean, that's between $1,300 and $1,500, you know, whereas this one is still in the $200 to $300 range. So huge difference in terms of uh, price. So I'm not saying that those are better than this. Um, it's more that just that they, they offer a more complete workflow. And so because of that, the model samples has really just kind of sat on the shelf for almost a year in my setup here. Um, there was a point where I actually considered selling it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> Basically, I talked myself out of it by having more sessions of sitting down, playing with it, uh, seeing what it can do by itself, and then seeing what it can do hooked up to other gear. And um, certainly the fancier electron sequencers can do even more. Uh, the, the main things that this cannot do compared to like the, the fancier ones like the Digitact, Digitone, Syntact, and higher tier ones is the model samples cannot send program change messages. Um, also, the model samples, it does send MIDI CCs, but they're hard-coded, meaning every knob has a particular CC number that it sends. And uh, if you're sending it into a DAW, like to use this as a MIDI controller for a DAW, that's no problem. But if you're sending it to another piece of hardware, there's a good chance that that piece of hardware also is hard-coded in terms of the MIDI CCs, and so therefore it, they, it's unlikely that they're going to match up. So in terms of um, the flexibility of using this, uh, these knobs to control other synths, it's not very flexible. So um, the, basically what makes me kind of want to circle back on this um, and fill in my thoughts from the past couple of years is um, focusing on what the model samples is really, really good at, uh, kind of, I think, where its strengths are. Um, now, I've already made the series of videos that I called the Electron Workstation uh, that were based on the model samples and showing how it's a really good, uh, I mean, I'd say entry-level, but also mid-level brain for a setup full of other hardware devices, um, especially for monophonic synthesizers. And I think that... Um, that concept applies to the other electron boxes as well. And of course, with the other electron boxes, you can go even, even uh, further. Um, where I've actually gone with this is what's behind me here. I, I have the Digitone keys and the Syntact, and I'm using those in tandem. 
um, as well as the black box as my sampler. And that's, I mean, that's just more power than I could ever, I could ever handle. Um, it's, uh, it's more than I, more than I need is what I, what I'm saying. And so, um, I, I did reach a point with the model samples where it wasn't quite enough of a sequencer, um, for where I was trying to go, especially on the melodic side, because it completely lacks polyphony, right? Um, the other reason I kind of wanted to move on is just the, the tactile nature of it. Now, the knobs themselves are fantastic. I actually really like these knobs. They're well spaced out. They're nice and low profile, so this thing slips into a backpack really easily. Um, but all the buttons are kind of cheap, and they're kind of, they're, they're squishy in a way that it makes it slower to use. So if you see somebody's fingers flying around on like the Digitact, for say, uh, for example, um, compared to flying around on the model samples, like it's not, you know, that's kind of a nitpicky thing, but it, it, it can actually matter if you're trying to play music very quickly or you're trying to do really fast things. Um, that tactile nature of the buttons on the, the Digi series is better. Now it's also louder. If you're playing in a situation where you need to be quiet, you're playing late at night and other people are sleeping, well, the model samples or the model cycles is gonna be better for that because it's just quieter. You can play it into headphones. So, um, but anyway, that tactile nature did kind of make me want to upgrade to the higher end boxes. And that's, that's part, of the, part of the decision that I made there. Um, but that said, uh, the, the build quality for this, for its price point of being between 200 and $300 uh, is fantastic. And um, so after, like I said, most of the way I've used it, you know, I, I kind of give it this little sidekick battery here so that it's very portable. And then I'll have a cable going out either to headphones or to a Bluetooth speaker or to a mixer and a bigger sound system or whatever it is I'm playing on. Um, and so that's primarily how I use it like this. And uh, I definitely continue to use it as like the music sketch pad type thing. Because I tried a lot of these other boxes as the musical sketch pad thinking they would be better. Um, the black box, for example, it's even smaller and more compact than this, um, but you still have to have an external battery, just like this one. And um, the sequencer in the black box is nowhere near as good. Now, it can do polyphony, so if, you're, if you want to sequence chords on a piano roll type of interface, the black box does that, and the model sample certainly does not. However, that's not really um, what I'm after. The, the way that I do sequencing on the model samples is a lot more kind of like um, putting in some intentional trigs, putting in some kind of random unintentional trigs, and seeing what comes out of it. And then using the probability and conditional triggers to make it more generative or make it more kind of complex and, and evolving over time. And those are things that you just can't do on the black box. Or at least you can't do, uh, you can't do as, as well. It does have probability, but it does not have the conditional triggers. Now, the fancier Electron boxes, of course, do have conditional triggers, um, and some of them, like the Digitone, also have polyphony. So, in that sense, it is just simply better. Um, now, I will say, though, I have tried using the, not the keys, but the original Digitone, uh, as well as the Syntact, as my kind of travel companion sketchpad type thing. And if you have, uh, you know, a larger amount of luggage or space with you, then they work well for that. But if you're traveling pretty light, um, well, let me just show you here. This is the backpack that I carry um, all the time, basically. Uh, it's you know wherever I keep my laptop and a lot of my work stuff. And anytime I'm traveling, I have to take this backpack with me. The model samples fits very nicely into this backpack, just kind of alongside my laptop, no problem. Uh, the black box also fits very nicely into this black into this backpack inside its own little case. But again, it's more, um, it's more limited in the sequencing realm. The Digitone and the Syntact, they don't really fit in here. They're just too big. Um, and also you need a more powerful battery to run, especially the Syntact, because you have to do USB-C with uh, USB-C PD and get the bird cord, which ships from Europe, so it's kind of expensive. So in order to use the Syntact as a portable thing, it's, it's possible, it's just more expensive and more challenging. Um, the Digitone is easier because you can run it off a ripcord, but even still, um, with the Digitone, you only have the four tracks, and of course you can do sample locking and all sorts of fancy stuff. But I found that when I had just the Digitone by itself, I always wanted something else uh, to accompany it. Um, I didn't like the Digitone just purely by itself as much, whereas the model samples by itself, I actually find to be a bit more fulfilling. Um, like the six tracks work well. I don't really mind that there's no polyphony in it most of the time. And 
I've found that um, there's just a particular kind of workflow or particular style of music that this evokes out of me that's different from what I get out of these other devices that I'm talking about. And um, so the model cycles, or sorry, the model samples is still unique in my workflow for that. It just, um, there's a certain type of thing that it does well that it actually does better than these other things. So I will say that um, since I got the Syntact, especially, um, that thing makes basically every drum sound I could ever want. And um, I'm really more into synthesis than I am into samples. And I, I fully kind of agree with the, the criticism of the model samples, since it's only a sample player, it can't sample in directly. That means you are still tethered to a computer to load new sounds on it. Now, one gig of sample memory is okay. Um, I think it should be much bigger, but you know, it's, it's workable. Um, especially if you're focusing mostly on one shots, single cycle oscillators and wavetables, you can fit tons of those on there. Now, if you want to play longer loops and do like a sample chopping type of thing, this is just not the device for that. Um, the black box, the MPC, the SP404, those are all better for that type of workflow. And that is generally speaking, uh, more of a hip hop oriented workflow, uh, the, the sample chopping and slicing type thing. Um, and I, I think that that's, yeah, model samples is just not the best fit if that's what you're going for. Um, so for me, I'll say using this as a one shot drum machine like I used to, isn't really that interesting anymore because I would rather synthesize the sounds myself and um, now, of course, I could make my own sample packs and then load them on here, but to me, that's just kind of too much work or too much effort. So instead, a, a preferable workflow for me would be to use whatever other synth I want to create the sounds and then sample those one shots into the black box and then use the black box as my one shot drum machine uh, with a, a pad controller for finger drumming. That's just a better workflow for me. Um, and again, there's no computer involved and it's just all kind of direct hardware to hardware. So in terms of loading a bunch of one shots on this and using it as my one shot drum machine, it's certainly well capable of that. And that's obviously it's kind of intended purpose, but the way I'm using it, uh, that's just not the way I use it anymore. Um, so basically I'm not really using this as a drum machine at all. Now that said, I do sometimes play beats on it still. I, I will make a rhythm section um, but usually that rhythm section is either it's a stand-in for something that I'm going to replace later with one of my other drum machines, or it's supplementary to one of my other drum machines. So for example, uh, I really like the, the electron sequencer in general for hi-hats. Um, you can do hi-hat sequences uh, where you play with the, you can put an LFO on the decay and have, that, have it kind of randomly switch between the closed hi-hat and the open hi-hat sound. And I really like that. Um, I use it a lot in my music. Any of these boxes can do that. But if I'm in a situation where all my other boxes are already full, all the tracks are already being used, and I just want to add that one effect, the model samples is great for that. But let's focus on the way I, I have reintegrated this into my setup. So again, it sat on the shelf for almost a full year. Um, when I pulled it back off the shelf, the main thing I wanted to do with it was to use it as a central sequencer for a bunch of monophonic synthesizers. And what I have, you probably can't quite see behind me, but I have a little setup with um, Volcas and also the Dreadbox Typhon, um, all of which are monophonic. And I thought, okay, well, the model samples would be a great way to sequence all of these as its own little contained setup. And my intention with that setup is not to play alongside these fancier boxes. It's actually to be its own self-contained thing. There's some times where I, I'm just kind of mentally drained and I wanna play music but I don't really have the wherewithal to sit down and do a full composition across these other boxes. I just want to start making very simple, like, you know, drum and bass kind of stuff, or just like make a simple beat and start building on it. I want things to be really, really dumbed down uh, for me. <laughs> and I found that the model samples as the sequencer and Volcas or other kind of simple instruments like that as the sound sources is a perfect match for that. So that's, that's where I've been with this. Um, now, actually, when I pulled it back out of the closet and started playing on it, uh, the, the funk button actually broke off. Uh, so my model samples lost its funk. And um, I, I reached out to Electron and uh, they offered to either fix it for free. It was out of warranty, by the way, but they still offered to fix it for free. Or they offered to send me the replacement part and um, off, you know, I could fix it myself. And they also sent instructions on, if you wanted to try it, here's what you would do. Now, 
the, the instructions was a three page PDF, very clear, very obvious. And I mean, I looked at it and was like, yeah, I'll just do this myself. This is super easy. Um, and the reason I wanted to do that is because for years now, I've been meaning to do the mod where you add tape behind the drum pads here to make them more sensitive for finger drumming. And, and the process to replace this whole button mat to fix the one that had broken is the same process, uh, basically. You'd be opening it up the same way. So I figured, okay, I'll do it myself. I'll fix, I'll repair this, and then I'll also do that button mod myself. So I did all that yesterday. Um, I recorded the whole process, but I don't think I'm gonna publish the whole thing because <laughs> I literally recorded 95 gigs of myself, you know, using a screwdriver, taking this apart, trying things, putting it together, taking it apart again. Um, it's, nobody needs to see all that. Um, I gotta stop recording in 4K for dumb stuff like that. Anyway, so um, I was able to repair this myself very easily. And like I said, Electron support was great, even though the unit is out of warranty. They were great at, uh, you know, sending me the free replacement part and the instructions I needed to do it. Um, and I will say it now feels like having a brand new thing because not only is the function button, of course, fixed, but also a problem I was having originally was that these buttons along the bottom um, would sometimes get stuck down. When you're doing parameter locks or sound locks on this thing, you have to hold the button down for a long time with one of your hands while the other hand is changing settings and tweaking knobs and stuff to, to dial in all the settings you want for that one step. And sometimes when you, after you're holding this down for like say a minute or two, if you would let go, it wouldn't pop back up all the way. It would kind of, it would kind of get stuck down and you have to mess with it in order to make it come up. Um, and this new button mat has fixed that problem so far. I mean, it's, you know, it's a day old, so maybe that problem will, will recur. I'm not sure, but, um, so far it feels like having a brand new unit and it's been great. It also gave me the, the opportunity to kind of look around inside it and see what other types of ideas I might have for modding it. I had some ideas, none of which panned out. I tried to use some blue tape over some of the, the red LEDs. I was hoping I could make them purple. Uh, yeah, it didn't work at all. Um, I also, I think what I am going to do though is I tried putting a gel over the screen to change it from being white to some other color. And that is actually pretty easy to do. And you can do it just on the outside. You don't have to even open up the unit for that. So I might do that in the future as just a fun little mod. But other than that, you know, I didn't really do much besides repair it. And then the, the little tape mod to make the, the drum pads better. Um, I will say, yes, it's better. Is it worth the amount of effort? Not necessarily, um, because I still I still prefer the external drum pad unit that I have here, the MPX-8, and I've made a full video on that also. This is still just gonna be a better drum pad, no matter what you do to modify this one. These are gonna be better. So my preference is still to use the external one here, but if your goal is really to have this be a standalone unit and make it as best as you possibly can, um, then I would say adding the tape, uh, the tape modification is worth it. So it, it makes it better in the sense that I can now do um, kind of faster like hi-hat fills and that kind of thing without it dropping notes or dropping trigs. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, the pads are still physically hard to hit. It takes less pressure now to get a response, but I, it's still a lot less comfortable than just better pads. So again, is it worth it? It's gonna be a case-by-case -case basis. If you really want to use this thing standalone with nothing else plugged into it, then yeah, it's probably worth it. Um, if you, but if you want to use this, if you're gonna use it with a MIDI controller anyway, then just use the pads on the MIDI controller and that's gonna be better. The main thing that I kinda of wanna focus on here is how I'm using this um, sonically in my setup. And so what I found is again, I'm not really that interested in using it as a drum machine anymore. Um, what I am interested in using it for is sound design and specifically for adding layers of samples to other synths that do not have a built-in capability to do that. Um, so there's a lot of options for that. And I'll talk about kind of the two primary ways that I'm using it. So the first way that I'm using this, and this is especially when I'm using it standalone or with maybe one or two other little companion devices, is that I'm using it as a synthesizer, a six track monophonic synthesizer. And um, the way I'm doing that is using the technique that I've covered in previous videos called wave cycle synthesis. And what that means is that you're taking a very tiny audio file. It could be something that's purpose made for this, which is known as a single cycle oscillator. And this uh, model cycles actually comes with some by default in the waves folder. Um, 
or you can of course add your own. Uh, or you can use a wavetable, uh, which is basically a bunch of single cycle oscillators strung together in one file. Um, it's kind of more of more of a more efficient way of loading them on here because you have a smaller file count and each file will have typically 120 single cycle oscillators strung together. And then you can scrub through the file with the start point, set your length to one, and then scrub through with the start point to find which one you like. Now, if you're using just a single cycle oscillator cut out of a wavetable, that's basically the same workflow. Um, but what's cool about the wavetables is that you can then start playing with the length knob to increase it from one slice to two to three, however many you want. And what I found is a lot of times finding a single slice that I like and then increasing that length to be say two or three adds a lot more kind of rich uh, tone and harmonics to the sound. So instead of it sounding like kind of a thin, you know, clean digital uh, sawtooth wave or something, it now sounds kind of thicker and fatter and grungier and dirtier. Um, I'm not gonna say it sounds analog, but it's more in that direction. And, uh, and I really like that and I find it very useful. And so the way that I'll use this as a synth is to load up that uh, same thing on all six tracks. It might be that I load the same wavetable on all six tracks, but each one's playing a different chunk of that file. It might be that I'm loading a different single cycle oscillator on each track. Um, and then I'll also mention that you can do this same technique with literally any audio file. It could be the samples you have on there. It could be something that you've recorded on your phone or with a field recording or you know vocals, anything, any audio file. You can do the same technique where you just turn the length down to the minimum value of zero or one. And then you start scrubbing through the file with the start point until you, and then you turn on the loop mode and you start hearing uh, the tones that come out of it. And I think that's really interesting, especially when you're talking about um, like vocals um, or other sounds that are just really hard to synthesize, like maybe the you know recording of certain acoustic instruments. You can basically take the kind of timbre, the acoustic uh, sonic qualities of any sound, any sample, and then turn them into a synthesizer. That you turn them into effectively the oscillator for the synthesizer. Now, I really enjoy this technique. I think it sounds awesome. I've done a lot of videos on it in the past. Um, and it's the way that it's, I kind of think about it in terms of related to acoustic instruments. It's like, imagine you had a six string instrument, like a guitar, but instead of having six guitar strings on it, each of those strings you can pull from whatever instrument you want. So like say you have one as a, as a stand-up bass, one as a cello, one's an electric bass, one's an electric guitar, one's a banjo, and one's a viola, right? You can pick one string from each instrument, load them all onto the same thing, and make them all sound correct. And then you can build your music based off of that. That's a lot like what this workflow is. It's like having six different strings. Each one can sound exactly how you want. Um, and you can, you can just build kind of complex music based on that. You can make harmonies between the different strings, uh, just like doing chords on a guitar. Um, or you can have each one do its own separate thing. While there is no built-in arpeggiator, it's trivially easy to make the sequencer behave like an arpeggiator if you want it um, to do arpeggios. So it's, um, I find it's really great for a lot of the more ambient music that I make, including drones. You can have, you can have this be a six track drone synth if you want, just every single sound just drones infinitely because the decay knob has an infinite value. So anything can drone on this. Um, it's also great for the kind of the ambient where you want to have like arpeggios of plucks going into a bunch of reverb, that kind of thing. It sounds great on this. Um, and then also it's great for having those kind of deep underlying tones uh, that kind of form the foundation or the bedrock of an ambient piece and then you have a bunch of the sprinkly bits on top of it. It's great for that too. So really um, the, the way that I use this for that kind of six track monophonic synth workflow, uh, for me it evokes a lot of this kind of slower ambient music um, out of me and I, I really like that. And like I said, it's different from what I get out of my other instruments. So for example, the black box can do all the same stuff I'm talking about um, with the single cycle oscillators or wavetables or whatever. You can do the same thing and do wave cycle synthesis on the black box just the same. The difference is the signal processing flow after that oscillator. You do have you know, filter and EQ and effects on that, but on the, the model samples, the, um, the filter, uh, the effects, the overdrive, um, first of all, I just think they sound really good, 
but also you can parameter lock each of them. So you can make the sound be more dynamic over time. And um, it's, uh, I think it's just a really, um, it's actually a deeper workflow in sound design. Uh, even though the black box is more expensive, this thing is kind of less than half the price of it. This one goes deeper in that particular style of synthesis. So that's the primary way that I'm using it now um, in the, the sonic uh, sense of like, if, if I want to write music on this, either starting out using this as the sketch pad or using it to kind of add more interest to some other piece that's already, you know, that's maybe starting simple and I want to add more kind of texture weirdness to it. This is good for that. Um, now, moving on to kind of part two or a separate, separate workflow. Um, the other way that I'm using this is to add samples to instruments that don't already have them. So my favorite pairing for this is right here, uh, the Volca drum. And I'm actually going to do a whole video just on this pairing because I think it works really well. So the Volca drum is a really fun drum synth. Um, it's basically uh, two layers of FM synthesis and then a weird um, physical modeling based effects unit. And so you can do all kinds of cool, crazy sounds out of it. And, uh, but it has no ability to sample or to play samples. And so what I've been doing is using the model samples as uh, a way of layering a sample sound on top of each of those Volca drum sounds. So that's one layer of sample, two layers of FM, plus effects. And that is plenty to work with um, when, you're, when you're doing specifically you know, percussive or drum synthesis. Um, you can also do kind of more melodic synthesis with this, but this wouldn't be the pairing I would choose for that purpose. So I'm finding also that, you know, the sequencer is just better than any of the Volca sequencers. And so um, you can address it in multiple ways. My favorite way is to put this in its six MIDI mode um, or six MIDI channel mode, where it listens on MIDI channels one through six for the six different tracks there. And then on this one, I keep it on the defaults where it sends on MIDI channels one through six. And so they perfectly line up. And so like if I was going with the, you know, the default kit here, I could have my kick, snare, you know, hi-hats, rim shots, whatever, all those sounds um, layered up with the Volca drum uh, making similar sounds. And there's a lot of different things you can do with that. Um, I take a lot of inspiration from the higher end drum machines, like the Analog Rhythm is uh, kind of one of the highest end ones uh, that I think is drool worthy. There's also the, the Korg Drum Log is the more modern uh, one that's, you know, about half the price, so it's, it's a lot more affordable. Um, but they, they both use a similar concept in which they're layering synthesis and samples to create the ultimate sound. And that's the same thing I'm doing here. I'm taking a layer of sample uh, on top of synthesis to create whatever sound. So using these two together, the model samples and the Volca Drum, I found a lot of creative potential in sound design for drum synthesis, where I get to choose in each of my sounds if I want the transient to be based on synthesis or to be based on a sample, and likewise if I want the body to be based on synthesis or sample or both. And um, I've also found, I actually haven't loaded in, you can get a sample pack of transients, and I should at some point probably load that on here, but I haven't done that yet. I've actually been just kind of making my own transients on the fly using similar techniques that I talked about earlier with the single cycle waveforms or wavetables or some tiny snippet of some random audio file. And I just make it really short. You just change the, you know, change the sample length to be very short and turn off the loop. Uh, so it just plays once and that's it. And you can basically build your own transient out of anything uh, from that. And I, I, I found that to be a really functional uh, and really fun way of kind of making a more unique sound than I would get out of just a synthesizer by itself. So I will also mention another feature of the model samples that makes it work really well as, um, as a standalone device, like especially the musical sketch pad idea, um, is the fact that it does audio over USB. And that means you can plug this into your computer or even a phone or a tablet or something, and you can just record all the sound coming out of this directly into your recording device and uh, without using a, a DAC, you know, an audio uh, digital uh, converter. And this is really uh, a huge money saver because if, if you are traveling with some other synth that doesn't have audio over USB capability and you want to record it, well, that means you also have to have an audio interface with you. And um, that's just more bulky stuff to bring around. And those things can cost, I mean, anywhere between 50 and, you know, 150 or more dollars. So you can easily get an audio interface that costs more than this, right? 
Now, the downside of doing audio over USB is this, from this is that it's purely a stereo file. You can't break out the stems of each individual track. Now you can if you, you know, mute all tracks but one and then record them one at a time. Uh, so that's totally possible. And there's only six tracks, so it doesn't take that long to do that if that's what you want. Um, but then you also would need to line up those audio files in your DAW so that they're in sync. Um, it's a bit more work than I care to do. So I just record it as a stereo file and work with that. And oftentimes what I'm recording is either just some fun little jam that I'm you know, gonna upload as a video like this, or maybe it's just to kind of get down an idea um, and then flesh it out later when I'm back at home, right? So I'm not particularly concerned with the lack of multi-track recording on this, um, but for some people that certainly could be a downside. And there's other devices out there now, like I believe the Poly End Play now supports multi-track recording, I think. Um, and I would say of the kind of stuff that's come out since the model samples, to me, the Poly N Play looks like the most um, compelling uh, competitor to this. There's also the, the Novation Circuit Rhythm, which, which is cool, um, but for me, the, the sequencing is more important and the, the circuit sequencer is just a lot more basic. Whereas the Poly N Play sequencer is very deep, I think maybe even deeper than this one. I'm not sure, I haven't used it myself, but, um, but I think that it's definitely a strong one if you're looking to kind of have one box without, uh, without expanding into other gear. So, but of course, Poly N Play is way more expensive. I think it's about three times as expensive as this. So, you know, there's gonna be trade-offs for the cost, of course. Um, I also want to mention the, the model cycles here. So I still have never used the model cycles. Um, I'm pretty interested to try it because I know I love this workflow and I know I love the sounds. Um, now, the converse of that is I now have the Syntact, which has all the same sounds, I believe. Um, and so it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to have both. The only thing that really appeals to me the most about the model cycles is the portability. The same way that this is portable, I, I'm thinking I could just have both of them, slap them back to back, put them in my backpack, and it would be roughly the same amount of portability. So I am tempted based on that, um, but in terms of the actual synthesis capabilities, of course, this intact blows it away, so I don't really need it. Likewise, the Digitone is also more, uh, more expansive, and I can, I can do that as well. So um, I think that for me, the model samples has definitely held its value. In fact, I would say it's, um, it's worth more than, than I paid for it. And that's uh, kind of why I would, um, I, I've convinced myself that there's no point in selling it because it's useful in so many different scenarios. Um, I can use it as a six track monophonic synth, especially for kind of more ambient music and like generative uh, sequencing. I can use it as a central sequencer brain for a bunch of other mono synths. Um, and then I can also use it as a uh, little travel companion, a uh, little you know, audio music sketch pad type thing. Um, that's, those are the primary use cases I have for it. And it's, um, it's been fantastic in all of those realms as just something to you know, kind of comfortably hold, sit on your lap, take it outside to a park or whatever, um, go sit in your backyard, any, anything like that. Um, it's just really easy to kind of grab and go, plug in headphones, plug in a small speaker and just mess around and have fun with it. Um, and then the process of then integrating that back in, you know, with more equipment back in my studio is really seamless, uh, primarily because each one of these six tracks can send both audio and MIDI simultaneously. And that's a huge feature that's kind of missing in the higher end electron boxes. It's really confusing actually, but like in the Syntact, for example, you have to choose, you have 12 tracks, but you have to choose whether they're an audio track or a MIDI track. There's no way to make it do both at once. And that's what this does by default is both at once. So it's very kind of confusing that their higher end boxes actually don't have this feature. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's more, it just means that you're more limited in terms of that layering style of sound design that I really like. So just want to point that out. That's like an out of the box feature in this that makes it really powerful to layer sound design on top of other uh, synthesizers or other drum synths or whatever it is you want to use. So um, primary limitations or frustrations with it, the most obvious one is that you can't just input chords in a regular way, either through this keyboard or like an external keyboard. If you play a chord, it's only going to record one note. It's monophonic per track. And so if you're looking for something to sequence chords, this probably isn't it. Now you can do it. 
you could use each track as one note of a chord to build up to a six note chord, but that's just not a very um, intuitive way to work, I think, especially for somebody who is, has some kind of classical musical training. Um, it's just, it's hard to think that way, I think, especially if you're used to a piano keyboard. Um, now, the converse of that, what I have been doing more with this is I, um, I start out by laying down kind of my rhythm of like where I want the tones or the notes to be. And then I go into each one and I set, I either set the, the note value based on, um, you know, the number like C, D, whatever, um, or you change the pitch. And that actually, the pitch knob applied to the whole track works really well because you're pitching, you can pitch in clean semitones, which means you can get a perfect, you know, fifth or seventh or octave or whatever you're looking for um, without having to think about, oh, am I in the, you know, key of D minor or whatever. You don't have to think about like, you don't have to know the theory behind it necessarily. You just have to know what sounds good to you. And so you can lay down a kind of a, a rhythm or a pattern where each of the six tracks is playing its notes in, with the timing that sounds right to you. And then you go through each layer and using the pitch knob, you uh, create your harmonies and intervals. And I find that that oftentimes, again, if I'm just kind of tired and I don't want to like think too hard, that is uh, a really nice workflow because you're just purely using your ears. It's like, it would be similar to having a guitar with six strings where you're strumming all the strings together, or maybe you're doing a you know, more intricate uh, picking of the strings, and then you're just turning the, the tuning knobs. So you're tuning each string to be whatever sound you want it to be or whatever bass sound you want it to be without doing any of the fretboard fingering. So it's kind of like that. It's, a, it's just a different way of approaching um, writing music. And again, I find it uh, to be kind of a very simple and relaxing way um, that's more just kind of a feedback loop between my hands and my ears versus um, when I'm working with all these other boxes, I have to be kind of a bit more awake, a bit more alert, use my brain more to think about, you know, chord progressions and things like that. So um, I, it's just a different way of working and it evokes a different style of music out of me. Um, and I appreciate that kind of, uh, that flexibility or that, that variation on this. The final feature I want to highlight that is just has been so useful in my studio is the fact that um, the MIDI ports on this uh, can switch, dynamically switch between the different types, the TRS type A and TRS type B. It's a frustration in any studio that uses TRS MIDI that there's not a standard yet and different instruments, especially older ones, will use um, type B, which is incompatible with type A. God forbid there's also a type C out there. Luckily, I don't have any devices that use that. But uh, at least between type A and type B, on the MIDI input, this will just auto detect whichever one it is. So you just plug it in and it works. On the output, you can select, they call it the polarity of standard versus inverted. Standard is type A, inverted is type B. Um, and so you can choose what you're sending out to whatever your downstream synth uh, expects to listen to. That, that amount of flexibility has made this extremely useful in so many setups with plugging it in with different things. Um, to the point even where like, I can take you know, one MIDI type in and spit out a different MIDI type out. Um, so it can be kind of like a MIDI router or a MIDI converter in that sense, which again, is just very useful in a lot of setups. So that's a great feature that I wish all synths had, um, but it's only the model cycles and the model samples to my knowledge are the only ones that support that at the moment. So um, that's a great little value add. It's like, if you put a dollar amount on that, I think that's worth $30, that feature. Like it's, it's worth a decent amount because if you have to buy a bunch of different little converters, the TRS type A and B converters to accommodate that for all these different synths, you're probably gonna be spending 20 to 30 bucks on all those, all those little adapters. Now I do have, I will say, if you're gonna buy something, well, this little guy has been fantastic. Well, let's see if I can get it to focus. Get in my front face, there we go. So this is a little retro kits thing and it's just taking five pin MIDI and spitting out either type A or B, or, or like I said, receiving type A or B. It's just a little adapter. And these have been fantastic. So in all my setups where I can't use, you know, a smarter device like this, I'm using these now and they're great. I recommend them. Um, I, I wanna also touch on very briefly um, the kind of failed product of the battery handle that was supposed to be the accessory for these. And um, too bad that that didn't work out. Um, I think it was a poor design to begin with 
uh, just because it used AA batteries. And who wants to juggle a bunch of AA batteries? You know, I have made my little custom thing here with, uh, this is a lithium ion, I think it's a 21700 cell inside. And I mean, this thing will run it for days and days and days. It's not a problem at all. Um, and I'm using the ripcord only because the, the port just fits really nicely and it's this nice sturdy uh, right angle plug. Um, but you don't actually need a ripcord for this. You can actually just take, if you get the right barrel adapter or the right barrel plug size, you can just take five volt uh, from a USB battery directly into the side input here and it'll work fine. You can also send five volts into the rear input. Um, I just prefer not to use this one because it's more, um, it's just a smaller barrel size and I feel like it's more fragile. This one feels a lot more sturdy. So I like the side input better, but up to you. You can send five volt USB into either one. That amount of power flexibility is super nice. Um, and which means you can also power this like off your laptop if you want, or you know, off um, your little phone charger or whatever. Like you don't have to carry a special power adapter for this. It's just a pretty standard thing. You just have to get the right um, DC barrel size that fits into these. Um, my little thing here, I stuck it on the side with dual lock tape as like a good enough solution. And it's been good enough that I haven't bothered to upgrade it for years. Um, the other little thing I did is I put some more dual lock tape on the back so I can stick my battery back here like that. And that allows me when I'm on a surface, it allows me to give it that nice little angle. Um, you know, when it's on a table like this, just gives it that nice little angle that, you know, points it up at you a little bit. So I, I like that. And that's kind of similar to what the battery handle concept was, was that it was a stand as well as, you know, a handle. So um, I'm finding that is working pretty well. And I would, I would recommend it if, if you're looking for something like that. Um, it's uh, easier than having like a separate wooden stand or something because it's just kind of built in part of the synth. So, The one other use case that I'll mention for this, um, which I will say is not the best use case, but um, I have used it a few times, is that if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking for a MIDI controller that has a whole bunch of knobs um, and you know, also a built-in sequencer, but let's even pretend it doesn't have a sequencer for a minute. If you're just looking for a MIDI controller that's a grid of knobs and then maybe some extra buttons, um, for the price of this, you know, 200-ish dollars, you're, you're not gonna find something that's much better, actually. This is actually a very powerful MIDI controller if you wanna use it that way. Um, and the, the build quality for that price is pretty darn good. Um, now the downside is that all these knobs send hard-coded MIDI CC messages so whatever your device that's receiving those has to be able to adjust to that. Now, if you're using this as a MIDI controller for a laptop, you know, for a DAW and SoftSense, that should be no problem at all. You just, just map it out however, however you want. Um, in terms of hardware, most other things aren't that flexible, but I've been using it sometimes as a MIDI controller for the black box, which has MIDI Learn. Uh, so I can customize what I want it to do on the black box. And that works great. It works exactly as you'd expect, just a single USB cable from here into the black box, turn a knob with MIDI Learn on and map it out however I want so I can have my cutoff and stuff going there. Um, so I will say it can be a, a pretty darn good value as a MIDI controller if, if those particular parameters or those particular limitations um, don't bother you uh, or they're, you know, you can work around them. Um, I don't think that's its primary purpose, but I have definitely seen people ask, you know, what's the best quality MIDI controller I can get for about 200 bucks that has a bunch of knobs. And I think this is, might actually be it, or at least it should be in the, in the running uh, for being a really good MIDI controller. All right, well, I think that concludes uh, what I have to say, my thoughts on the Electron model samples. Um, it's definitely a huge value. The, the amount of bang for your buck you get out of the model samples, I think is better than anything else in my studio, anything else I've purchased here. Um, it really just brings a lot to the table. Um, of course, as a drum machine, uh, for synthesis, uh, for monophonic synthesis, for sequencing, um, for flexibility in MIDI, audio, and power. Uh, all three of those, the different types of cables and connections you're gonna have to use for those, um, it's really flexible. So I think it's a fantastic value and um, it's a great starting point for pretty much anybody who wants to work with samples or who wants to work with um, kind of designing your own uh, oscillators and, and sound design elements uh, for monophonic synthesis. And also anybody who wants a multi-track groove box. So I think it's, it has a lot of versatility in all of these realms and it's, uh, it's just been a great companion for me, um, both 
at home while traveling and then kind of plugged into my larger studio setup. All right, well, uh, thanks for joining. I hope, uh, hope this was helpful, informative, entertaining, any of that, any of the above, and I will catch you on the next one. Cheers.